and his country. Would you turn with me to the book of Titus? Titus. The book of Titus is a word that the Lord put in my heart about a month ago. And uh, I didn't plan to bring it yet. I was just simply uh, mulling it over and thinking about it. And, but the Lord created the circumstance for me to be here and speak this word. So in the book of Titus, not a book that is very, very uh, much known. It's a very small book. It's between the book of 2 Timothy and Philemon. And there we're going to look at a couple of verses in chapter 2. Phil, uh, Titus chapter 2. And we're going to be reading from verse 11. Verse 11. But before I read, I want to make a prayer and just present myself to the Lord, uh, that the Lord would be the one that would speak here tonight and not myself. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for your visitation here tonight. Lord, we're fully, fully convinced that you are here with us. Your presence is very palpable. Your presence is very real. Lord, you are here because you promised to be in the midst of the praises of your people. And we have worshipped you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we have called upon your name. And Lord, your presence is truly in this place. But now, Lord, as we transition into the preaching and the teaching of your word, Lord, we ask that you would anoint that you would anoint me, Lord. Anoint me. I am the instrument that you chose. Lord, speak through me. Let your words of life, O oh God, bring in to each and every one of us wisdom and understanding. Let your word, O oh God, edify our souls, our spirits. Help us to grow, Lord God. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand your word here tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, I present you myself. Have your way, Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So we're going to read from verse 11 <clears throat> to 15, the book of Titus. If you don't have your Bible uh, and you have your phone, please make sure that your phone is on mute so that it doesn't uh, disturb us, or you could also follow along with the, uh, the uh, projection. It says like this, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So we've read from verses 11 through 15. The Lord has uh, put in my mind and in my heart to talk on the topic of grace, the grace of God. And I have entitled this message, The School of Grace. Say with me, The School of Grace. The School of Grace. La Escuela de la Gracia. And tonight, I am very privileged because I am talking about one of my favorite topics, the topic of grace. Grace. And not so much the person called grace, but the grace of God. And I want to kind of do a Bible study uh, with you guys uh, as the Lord allows the time. And then we're going to get into the topic of the school of grace. But we want to 
I like to always establish a foundation. I don't like to give it, I don't like to uh, just uh, take for granted that everyone knows. Uh, so I always establish a foundation. So we begin with the word translated grace in the New Testament comes from the Greek word charis, charis, which means three things, favor, blessing, or kindness. So when we hear the word grace in the word of God, think about those three words, right? The word was written in Greek, so it's the word charis, but when that gets translated into English, right, we start seeing that it's more than just, you know, what we understand what by grace. It's a little more. It's a favor, a blessing, or a kindness. Now, God's grace is different from man's grace, right? We can all extend grace to each other, and, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing when we show blessings we give each other blessings and birthday gifts and we extend kindness and uh, favors for one another right like some some young people say hey do me a solid <laughs> right i remember one time when i first heard that somebody said do me a solid and i was you know i was still very young i you know i didn't know a lot of street talk you know i wasn't raised in the streets so I just was like, do you a solid? Uh, what are you talking about? Do me a favor. Don't you get it? I was a little boy at the time. But the point is, is that, you know, we, we know what we're you know what I'm talking about. To some of you, is, you know, it's a, it's a dawn for that word. But uh, we can all extend kindness, grace to one another. But when God extends grace, it takes on a whole different powerful, profound meaning. That I extend grace to another person, my equal, another human being, beautiful, applaud me, but it ends there. But when God extends grace, it's not the same. Because God is not human and, or he is not, a, he is not common. God is the high and lifted God who is holy and who lives forevermore. He is the eternal God that has no beginning or end. He is, as I just said, high and lifted up. His throne is in the heavens. He has no beginning and he has no end. And when he decides to show grace, to a human being that lives within the confines of time and space. But he who is eternal decides to extend and humble himself all the way down and extend the favor, a blessing, or some sort of kindness. It's a whole different ballgame. Because as I said, he is high and lifted up. I want you to turn with me. And you don't necessarily have to do it, but just the person that's in the projection. I want us to look at the book of Isaiah. Kind of to just further uh, a little bit on, on what the word says that God is. Isaiah chapter 57. So that the person that's helping me with the uh, projection. Isaiah 57. Let us look. Beginning with verse 15. As they get themselves squared away, I'll try to be a little quicker here. My eyes are also telling me that I probably need some help. I need to visit, visit the ophthalmologist. So, but those letters seem a little small. So I'm going to go. <laughs> it's about that time in life, right? I didn't want to visit the ophthalmologist. I don't want to visit him. But anyway, look what it says. And you could follow on the screen. It says, Isaiah 57, verse 15. For this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place. 
but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry. For then the spirit of man would grow faint before me, the breath of man that I have created. So in the beginning there, it says that he is the high and lifted God, the lofty one. Although he is at that level, because he is a God of grace, he is able to humble himself and be with the lowly and contrite. That is grace. It is a favor that is shown to those that deserve to be cursed for the sins that they have. So in turn of, in, in, instead of cursing, he extends favor. So grace is God lowering himself. Grace is God's meekness, his self-abnegation. It is, it is his making himself lowly. That's the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, and again, I just want to establish kind of like a foundation of what is the grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 8, it says that by grace you are saved. Through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So salvation, the salvation that we have came because God extended his grace. It says, by grace you were saved. The grace of God brought us salvation. Grace is the only way anyone can enter into a relationship with God. The only way that we can know God, enter into, enter into some sort of closeness or relationship is because he extends grace. The beginning of grace, we could say that began in the Garden of Eden. When God killed an animal to cover the sin of, of Adam and Eve... He was extending grace. He had given Adam and Eve a commandment, which we all know. We know the story. They disobeyed the commandment, and God had every right to destroy them. They had disobeyed the rule that they were given. But God in turn said, I'm not going to destroy them. I'm going to extend grace. And what did he do? He killed an animal. And with the coverings of that animal, he covered them. He simply chose to do so. Instead of destroying them, he chose to forgive them. And give them an opportunity to be, to be right with him. Then grace continues... Throughout the Old Testament. Specifically when God instituted the blood sacrifices. In the book of Exodus. As a means to atone for sin. So in the Old Testament. And again this is just rehashing a little bit. In the book of Exodus. After God had separated his people, the people of Israel, knowing the condition that man lived under, the condition of sin, and how sin was always a, a block, it was a way, sin always destroys our communion with God. But since God is a God of grace, he instituted the blood sacrifices. And we know, right, that there were instructions. You needed to bring a ram, a bull, uh, 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 some sort of animal and for, for the poor. In some cases, they could just bring a, a, 
a, a bird. They were, they were daily sacrifices. They were weekly sacrifices. They were, there was a yearly sacrifice, the Day of Atonement. And God instituted these blood sacrifices. But it wasn't so much the blood of these animals that cleansed the sinners. It was their faith in what God established. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.4 that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sin. So it wasn't so much the blood of those animals that cleansed the people. No, it was it was, the, it was God seeing their faith in what God established and God saying, because they've, they've shown faith in what I've established, then my grace allows them to be forgiven. But it's always grace. It always takes grace to, 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 to approach God, his grace. So the grace of God brought forgiveness to those that trusted in him. Grace impacts every aspect of God's dealings with humanity. Every action of God towards us involves his grace. I want you to turn with me to the book of Exodus, beginning with chapter 34, verse 6. It says, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Look what it says about God. It says that he is compassionate and gracious. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And if we get to verse 7, look what it says in verse 7. It says, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And we'll leave it there for now. God is a God of grace. God is a God of compassion. You know, oftentimes, the way we think of God, I don't know if it was uh, taught to us when we were young, is that God is an angry God. But God is a happy God, number one. He is a gracious God. He is a merciful God. And whoever made you th or, or, or taught you or or put it in your mind that God is an angry God, doesn't know God. Because the God that is revealed in the scriptures is a God of grace. Who's always extending himself, lowering himself, and reaching out for man. Even though man is constantly turning his back on him. Grace impacts every aspect, aspect of God's dealings with humanity. God's character is to be graceful, is to be gracious. God shows grace because he is gracious. And there's an interesting relation between grace, mercy, and love. Even grace and mercy, sometimes, right, we kind of don't get them, we don't get them right. We, we kind of, you know, is, is that the grace of God? Is that the forgiveness of God? Right, because they're, they're, like, they're, they're like a highway, a two a, a, a a two-lane highway. They, they run very parallel to each other, but they're very different. And I kind of want to give you a little explanation of how different they are. For instance, mercy is when God with, withholds the punishment. So it takes God's mercy, right? Because we sin, we turn away from God, we break God's commandments, and it takes God's mercy to withhold his punishment. But his mercy is what allows him to now demonstrate favor. His, excuse me, his grace is what then allows him to extend favor to, upon those that don't deserve it at all. So the mercy of God withhold the punishment, withholds the punishment, but the grace of God then blesses us. And you see how they run kind of side by side? 
There is a verse in, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 4 and 5, where you see the three, grace, mercy, and love, all working together. Look what it says here. But because of his great love, right, for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression, it is by grace you have been saved. So there you see all three working together. Because he's a God of love, he showed mercy and saved us by grace. It's like the trilogy of God, in a sense, right? It's just God extending himself. Mercy doesn't allow him to bring judgment. But then his grace says, I'm going to extend the favor. I'm going to lower myself and I'm going to bless them. So they run very, very similar. They, they run side by side with each other. And there's a verse where you literally see them working together. The three attributes of God, love, mercy, and grace. But the greatest expression of God's grace was when he sent us Jesus. Right? The Bible says in John 3.16, a verse we all know. For God so loved the world. And again, you're going to see love. Then what did he do? That he gave. And what is that? When, you, when he gives of himself, that's grace. He so loved the world. That he gave his one and only begotten son. That's the greatest expression of his grace. Because he gave his most precious value. He gave of himself. He gave his son Jesus. And the Bible says that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The greatest expression of God's grace is when he gave us Jesus. Grace is God giving the greatest treasure to the least deserving, which is every one of us. And I pray that tonight you would have, and not by my skills, but, but that the word of God, the word of God, that we are opening wide open and speaking, the word of God would illuminate you, open up your eyes, impact your heart like never before so that you could understand the grace of God. And from today on, begin a new life in Christ, knowing the grace of God. I pray that today you would go to school, <laughs> the school of grace. How many went to school here today? Let me see those hands. Janice went to school, but because not, not so much to learn, but to give. Okay, we got a good number. How many didn't go to school? Oh, that's a pretty big group. Well, you're in school today. You're in school tonight. You didn't go to school, but, but you're in a different school, the school of grace. And we're going to continue talking about that. So... I've established that as a principle just or, or, or as a foundation so that you have an idea that the grace of God has been revealed ever since the Garden of Eden. All the way to the most highest expression of his grace, Jesus Christ. And for those that are in Jesus Christ, the Bible says there is no condemnation. We are in Christ. But let's go now to... The portion of scripture that the Lord gave me for tonight. Titus chapter 2. And again, it just says the same thing that, you know, we established. That salvation comes by grace. But let's read it all over again. Because there was a verse there that truly impacted me. And it is the purpose of this message here, message here tonight. So Titus chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, 
that offers salvation to all people. So it is important to understand that salvation is not by works. No matter what you and I do, we could never earn enough to get to heaven. For instance, there was a man who died and he went straight to heaven. But when he got to heaven, he was met at the doorstep of heaven or the door of heaven by, by the apostle Peter. And when he got there, Peter says, welcome, how can I help you? He said, well, I'm here, uh, I'm ready to enter. And the apostle Peter says, well, in order to enter, you need a thousand points. Uh, so tell me all that you've done and I will begin to, you know, uh, do the math. And when you get to a thousand, I'll let you in. And well, the man says, okay, sure, no problem. So start telling me who you are, what you've done, and why do you deserve to go to heaven? Oh, sure, no problem. Uh, well, I was saved my entire life. I never devoted my life to the world. Ever since I was a young boy, I was taken to church, and I lived my entire childhood and adolescence and my youth years and my adult years serving the Lord. The Apostle Paul says, excuse me, the Apostle Peter says, wonderful. That is one point. Man says, one point. Hmm. Okay, well, so go ahead, go on. Okay, well, I got married when I was 25 years old, and I was faithful to my wife, my wife for the 53 years that we were married. I never sinned, neither in my thoughts, and obviously, I never committed any adultery. The Apostle Peter says, absolutely great. That is another point. The man looks at Peter and says, man, this is, this, how is this possible? Apostle Peter says, go on. Okay, I was a deacon in my church for about 25 years. I helped open up a kitchen in my, a, 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 uh, what they call a, a soup kitchen for, as an outreach to my community. I worked with the youth ministry, the children's ministry, and I even visited the, 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 uh, the prisoners in, in jail. Apostle Peter says, beautiful, wonderful. That is another point. The man basically now says, I, I, I mean, I've told them everything I've done my entire life. I'm still 997 points away. I mean, if it's not for the grace of God, I would never be able to get to heaven. And immediately the Apostle Peter says, ding, 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 ding. The grace of God, that's what I was waiting for. Come on in. The doors of heaven are open for you. <laughs> the grace of God Amen. is what it takes to get to heaven. Our works are but menial, menial. So that's why the apostle here says that it is by grace that we are saved. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Well, just to move a little quickly, we'll just stay there in Titus. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And it is important to understand that salvation is not by works. Salvation is strictly done on the basis of God's grace. The God's gift of grace comes to us through the cross of Jesus. The cross makes it all possible. Now, within that salvation, there comes different... Uh, different aspects to the to to the uh to salvation 
For instance, come with me to Romans chapter 3. Now we're going to look a little bit into what salvation did for us. Because the first thing we've established is that the grace of God saved us. But in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So we've established that we've been saved by grace, right? But now here it says that we've also been freely justified by grace. So apparently there was a, a, a tribunal in heaven where God is sitting at the throne. There is Satan, the persecutor or, or the prosecuting attorney against man. Saying... To God the Father who's sitting in heaven, all the errors and mistakes and sins that man has committed. But along comes Jesus, the defendant's lawyer, the defendant of mankind who is being accused, Adam and everyone that ever existed. And there is Satan, the prosecuting attorney, just saying, look at how many times so-and-so has sinned. Look at how many times your word and your laws say that anybody who sins deserves eternal death and eternal condemnation. But along comes the lawyer, Jesus. And he says, he is correct. Anyone that that sins deserves death. But I came as a representation, a substitute to Adam. And I came as a representation of all of humanity. And I died on their, on, on their behalf. And I have shed the blood. And my blood is the ransom for their sins. So therefore, they now can now be justified before you O father and as the father looks and investigates and 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 sees that this that the sacrifice of jesus come perfectly you know uh, uh, uh appeases the the justice of god god in heaven says man is justified through the redemptive work of jesus christ give him praise And that's where we get this verse, right? We've been justified freely by his grace. So salvation isn't just, you know, okay, he saved me. My name is written in the book of life. A a aside from the salvation being now uh, free from condemnation, aside from that, we've also been justified before the sight of God. We've been declared righteous because God is a God of grace. Look what it says. Another aspect to God's grace is that he sanctifies us. Look what it says in 2 Thessalonians. And I want to move a little quickly. But I want to still establish this. Because I want us to understand all the aspects of salvation that came along with being now part of the family of God. Being saved. P part of it is our justification. But now we're going to talk about sanctification. And again, these are all aspects to our salvation. This is all the grace of God, how God has manifested his grace upon us. Look what it says, Second Thessalonians, beginning with chapter 2. Verse 13. It says, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit 
and through the belief in the truth. So notice where it's, what it says. It says that we were, we, God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So uh, as, as well as being justified by God's grace, we are also sanctified by God's grace. We've been declared holy before the presence of God. Although we are still sinners... And there is still a level of, of sanctification process that we need to go through. There is, before the eyes of God, we've been already declared holy through the sacrifice of Jesus. So salvation has declared us justified and salvation has declared us holy before the presence of God. And all these things I mention because now we're going to get into what the apostle, what, what the apostle or what Titus is sharing or, or uh, Paul when he writes to Titus. Let us go back to the portion of scripture that we chose. 2.11. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Right? That's what we've established. The grace of God brought salvation. But look what it says. And this was the verse that had a big impact on me. And it is the purpose of today's message. That was, that was the rima that the Lord gave me. Look at verse 12. And that's why I've called this message the school of God's grace. Because look what grace does. It teaches. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And we're going to stop right there. Grace teaches us a very simple word. No. You know, again, when I was very young and not understanding a lot of the Bible and, and, and a lot of the things that I know now, I didn't understand when I was a young man, uh, very new to the scriptures. Uh, I always thought, right, in the Old Testament, God is always saying, no, no, no. But in the New Testament, he says, yes, yes, yes. Then I grew up and the Lord shows me that the grace is not a, that God's grace is not a license to sin that says, yes, 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 do it. Yes, yes. No. In fact, it's no in capital letters. <laughs> Glory to God. The law says no, a soft no. The grace says no. I, a hard no. I thought it was, I thought, I thought things got easier. <laughs> they do. They do. And we're going to explain that a little further. But what does it teach us to say? You know, when you go to school on your very first day, when you started kindergarten, they started to teach you something. What was it that they first taught you in kindergarten? Let's see if we remember. What was the first things they taught you? Huh? Do not get up. Do not touch. Do not hit the other person. A lot of no's. Don't do this. Don't do that. Before they even gave you the pencil to do something, they had to give you a set of no's. God's grace teaches us to say no. No to ungodliness. What is ungodliness? 
They're the wicked things of this world. It is the things that are wrong in this world. It are, they are the things that directly oppose God's standards. Ungodliness. This world and the system of this world constantly opposes God and God's kingdom. Every industry, every industry, whether it's the industry of education, government, healthcare, finance, entertainment, housing, every industry in one way, form, or another is always in direct opposition to God's standards and principles. And the higher up you go in those industries, the more immorality you see, the more, I mean, just total disregard for what is right. The system of this world. The Bible says that the ruler of this world is Satan. Anything that pertains to the system of this world is always going to be surrounded with ungodliness. And God wants to tell you in the school of grace, because grace teaches you to say no to ungodliness. Grace teaches you that everything in this world is corrupt. And, the, and if we love the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in us. We have to learn to say no to ungodliness. But there is grace of God that helps you to say no. You know, serving the Lord comes with challenges. But God is not a God that sets the bar high and leaves you on your own. To fail. God is a God of grace. And it is not with your own works. It is with the grace of God. That you're going to be able to say no. Because the grace of God teaches you. The grace of God is a school. And you've already enrolled in the school. You're in the school. You just got to apply yourself and allow grace to work in you. But that grace that God has already revealed to you, teaches you, will enable you to say no to ungodliness. What is the second thing it teaches you to say no to? It teaches you to say no. Verse 12. To worldly passions. It teaches you to say no. To the flesh. Worldly passions. So notice what the grace of God is teaching you. Number one, say no to the world. Everything out there. Everything that's, that's in this world, the system of this world, everything that moves about in this world, the governments of this world, everything is corrupted. Like I said, every industry. But then he says that the grace of God teaches us to also say no to worldly passion. And that word passion are our youthful desires. The word passion is very connected to sexual immorality. And we are constantly fighting this battle. Of sexual immorality around us. Because the world. Is constantly selling us. The things and the passions of this world. But the grace of God. 
allows you to say no to the worldly passions. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins, sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Flee, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. The grace of God is telling you to say no. You may say, but I'm weak. This is my, this is, this is my Achilles heel. I keep, I, I keep stumbling on this. I want you to know that the grace of God is enough. The grace of God is sufficient to help you to say no. You're not going to do it on your own strength. The grace of God is going to enable you to say no. The grace of God teaches you. It instructs you. You're in the school of grace. But to worldly passions, you can't compromise Saint Augustine of Hippo just to give you a little bit of history was a theologian in the 4th century a theologian in the Roman Catholic religion but the Lord revealed himself to Saint Augustine and he became a Christian. And he wrote, you know, many theologians of that time used to write books. And, and a lot of, you know, their personal uh, experiences. And one of the books that he wrote was called Confessions. And in that book con called Confessions, he confessed to a prayer that he made. His prayer and this was before, you know, the Lord had revealed to himself to him was, God, please make me good, but not yet. He knew that God had the power to make him be good, be holy, be of honor before the Lord. But St. Augustine confesses that he liked to dabble with sin. And that's why he said, not yet. Let me enjoy this a little bit. I want to be good, but don't change me just yet. And I think that some of us are in that boat. Where we tell the Lord, Lord, change me, change me, change me. Change me. But then we say, oh, maybe not quite yet. Let me experience a little bit. When we deal with worldly passions, sexual immorality, you need to be radical. You need to be able to, 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 to just... Understand that there's a barking beast within you that's, that's craving to be satisfied and he wants to be gratified and he's constantly barking and barking and barking. You cannot just take things lightly and just, oh, well, no, no, no. You got to be radical with you, no. Because, if, because the very moment that you begin to compromise, that's your failure right there. It can't be a soft no. The grace of God is not a soft no. It doesn't teach you to say no well, today, but maybe not tomorrow. No, the grace of God teaches you to say yeah, not yes, but no. A resounding no. What do you think was, what, what, what do you think allowed somebody like Joseph to, to, to say no to the advances of that woman. 
the grace of God, the fear of God. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee from the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness. Flee from the youthful desires, the youthful passions. Run and hide and run away from them. Don't try to rebuke Satan in that moment. No, run. And pursue righteousness. In the school of grace, the name of the school is grace. The curriculum of the school is grace. The subject matter that they teach is grace. The teacher is called grace. Grace teaches you. It teaches you. It instructs you. The grace of God grabs you by the hand and it says, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you. Who's the counselor in the in the school of grace? Grace. Who's the dean in the school of grace? Grace. The grace of God is sufficient for everything that pertains to life. Every struggle, every challenge that you have in your Christian walk is resolved when you have a clear understanding of God's grace upon your life. But when you take God's grace, and I don't know, maybe I don't want to go there just yet. Grace is our instructor, our advisor, our encourager, our exhorter. He guides us, restrains us, enables us, and rewards us. The grace of God teaches, it teaches you. Think back to some of your better teachers when you were growing up in school, when you were in, when you were in grade school, how patient that teacher was. Oftentimes, you know, going above and beyond to help you to understand the subject matter. Just like there were some teachers that did a poor job, there were teachers that did a great job. They invested time in you. They went back and forth and explained things with you. I want you to know that the grace of God, that's how it operates. You're here because God has had grace on you. God is slow to anger. He is great in mercy. Great in mercy, slow to anger. God takes his time with you because he loves you. That's in the school of grace. There are other schools. There are a lot of other schools in Christianity. When I go to the internet, I find the school of ministry. Come to our university. We're going to give you a, a, we're, we're going to enroll you in our school of ministry. And in the school of ministry, they teach you to exercise your gifts. They teach you to meet the changes of this modern society with Christianity, right? They teach you ministry. But they're focusing on your gifts. And using modern technology and modern, uh, I I don't know, resources and tools to help you reach this dying and lost world. And you're taught to exercise your gift in the school of ministry. They're working with your gifts. In the school of evangelization... They teach you to evangelize the world and win people for Christ. 
in the school of prophets, they teach you how to prophesy. In the school of preaching, they teach you to preach and to overwhelm the multitudes with your eloquence and your Bible information. In the school of divinity, they teach you theology and they teach you Bible archaeology and sociology and Bible history. And you learn and you get a big grasp of a lot of Bible information. And they are perfecting and working with your gifts. But in the school of grace, God is working to perfect your fruits. Because at the end of the day, you shall know them by their fruits, not their gifts. Many sectors in the Christian community have gotten it all wrong. Because they want to focus on the gifts of the people. And they want to perfect the gifts. And they want to make sure that we have good preachers. And good teachers. And good evangelizers. And good, you know, prophets. But you know what? They don't say no to ungodliness. And God is saying, I want to raise up a church that understands that I am the God of that is holy and I want a people that know how to say no to ungodliness before they know how to preach, before they know how to minister, before they know how to do anything in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. What's more important, to serve the Lord in a, in a ministry doing something for God or saying no to sin? I don't know about you, but it means more to God when you say no to sin, you don't compromise with sin, than, no, than, than any gift that you have that you want to use here in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Our God will not be mocked. Our God is holy. And he has invested too much in his son, Jesus Christ. His grace has been revealed and he's not going to compromise his values. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. These schools teach you to exercise your gift, but they've missed, the, they've missed their calling. I'm sorry to say they've missed their calling. If they are not teaching grace, if they're not bringing people to the school of grace, then it's just a lot of chatter. It's just a lot of sound. It's just a lot of symbols sounding, but people that are empty of God. I want you to know that God has already enrolled you in the school of grace. And God wants you to be a graduate in that student, in that school. He wants you to succeed in that school. And he has already provided all of him so that you can succeed. And you could be a difference maker in your society. You could be a difference maker. You could be a true follower of Christ. And not just be someone who claps, who comes here, but doesn't know God. Hallelujah. And you know what's interesting about the school of grace? Is that it's free. I don't got to pay tuition to go there. I don't got to pay room and board. I don't have to pay for books. I don't even have to leave my, 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 the comfort of my city and my home. I don't have to travel aboard. The school of grace is right here in the presence of God. Right here. Sometimes my heart breaks when I hear of churches that are focusing on sending their youth to ministry and go, yeah, go, go, join the school of ministry and you're going to come back on fire. Man, I tell you, I don't know one person, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make enemies here, but I don't know one person in my circles that has gone af abroad or has gone somewhere to join some school of ministry, no matter what name, what ministry, and has come back on fire. If anything, they, they left on fire. They came back like, the firemen threw water all over them. 
because where the school of grace isn't, where grace is not being taught, where the curriculum isn't grace, where the school isn't grace, where the topic isn't grace, where we're not being taught to fear God and honor God and obey God and love God, I don't care, again, how much, how much information you, you have of the Bible. You could come with me and an archaeologist just digged up some new information on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So what if you can't say no to sin? You could impress me by telling me, you know, that you, maybe you found the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know. You went somewhere to Israel and you found them. I don't know. But if you can't say no to ungodliness, what good is it? What good is it? It says no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. It is possible, young person. It is possible in this day and age where sin has abounded. What has abounded? Grace, Grace has abounded. Yeah. In this day and age. Where it's easy to sin. Where we are surrounded by sin. In this world that is constantly feeding your, 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 your worldly passions. It is possible to live a self-controlled, upright, godly life before him. Because the grace of God enables you. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Let's begin with verse 2. Grace and peace be yours. In abundance, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Everything you need. His grace. Note it right. It said, it said his grace. Let's go back. Grace and peace be yours in abundance, in abundance. God wants to rain grace and peace in abundance upon you. And then it says in verse 3, his divine power, because that's what grace is. It's his power. He has given you everything that you need to live, everything we need for a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Everything. If you're failing. If you're falling. If you, are, if you f fell and you can't get up. It's not because God is in, unable. It's not because the grace isn't there extending his arm and saying, come on, come on, get up, get up. Let's go. The arm is there. You're drowning, and, you're, and somebody's extending their arm and saying, I'm right here. Reach out. Let's go. But you're drowning. You're drowning. And God is right there. <laughs> Maybe we just need to get up. There was one time that I was with my dad and my brothers and my stepmother. We went to New Hampshire. We went to New Hampshire on a, I don't know, I must have been 12, 13 years old. We went to, it's funny as I remember, we went to New Hampshire on a summer vacation. And we went, uh, we got in this like, I don't know, we went on a, an amusement park. And 
they had a pond, a very small pond, but you could get on a boat and go from one side of the pond to the other pond, right? I think it might have been a, like one of those paddle boats. And I remember that in the middle of, the, of that pond, there was a fountain. You know how they have these fountains that spit up water out of their mouth or whatever? So, you know, my stepmother, you know, like, she, here we are, us five, I'm 12, my younger brother is maybe 10, the other one's maybe four or five, and, you know, the, the water is, is, is about to hit us, and I remember that she, she's trying to duck, you know, not get wet by a simple, a simple, I mean, water, and as she's trying to duck, she tilted the boat over, right, and she doesn't know how to swim, so she just fell over, and, you know, we... All of us all got up, right? Because the water was literally right here. And she was in the water going, hey, help me, hey, help me. Ayuda, ayuda, man. And I remember my father said, parate. <laughs> and she just, she just got up so embarrassed because she was panicking. But all she needed to do was get up. It's that simple. My dad wasn't concerned about her, you know, he was concerned about my, my, our younger brother, right? My, my younger brother was like four at the time. But, you know, she's screaming her head off. She thought she was going to drown. And, you know, all she needed to do was stand up. That's all you need to do. You're not going to drown. The grace of God says, stand up. Let's go. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. The enabling power of God. We'll start wrapping it up. But there's still some more that I have to share. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians fifteen ten. It says, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And in his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So what are we talking about? We've already said that the grace of God reached us when we were lost. It saved us. The grace of God saved us. Right? We were washed by the blood of Jesus. We were declared, we were declared justified by the grace of God. We've been declared sanctified by the grace of God. The grace of God teaches us when you enroll in the school of grace, the, 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 the grace itself educates you. It teaches you. The grace of God teaches you to say no to ungodliness. It teaches you to say no to worldly passions. But then it says so that you could live a self-controlled, upright, godly life. And as you do that, you begin to serve the Lord and you become useful in the kingdom of God. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And it says, and his grace to me was not without effect. Because the grace of God doesn't leave you the same. Trust me. When you get a... When, when you get a <clears throat> When, when you get a revelation, you get an impact, an impartation of God's grace. You don't just say, well, okay. It has an effect on you. It puts a weight of glory on you. It, it makes you just, I, I got to do something for God. I, I, I'm not just going to stand still and watch Things perish and fall and, and people die without Christ. It, 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 it puts, 
It, it puts fire in your belly to do something for God. The grace of God, you know, it, it compels you to give unto God what he has done for you. That por gracia, por lo que por gracia hemos recibido. The grace of God. Look what it says. It left me with, it, it, to me, it says, by the grace. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. The work of the, the grace of God compels you to serve the Lord. It compels, it, it just, it, it propels you to service. How many times, and I'm sure many of you here can attest that, you know, a trial, a, a circumstance, a, a bad moment with someone, you know, stones rubbing against stones. And, and sometimes, you know, we get discouraged and we want to just, you know, I'm not going to do this for the Lord anymore. It's just, what's the point of it, man? You know, it, you just feel like you're not getting anywhere with people and it's hard to work with people and, 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 and right, you just want to give it all up. And then all of a sudden you get a, a shot of the grace of God. You, man, what a, man, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I'm going to press on in the name of the Lord. I don't care what they've done to me. Why? Because the grace of God just, it infuses you with energy to serve the Lord because you're grateful for what God has done for you, that he chose you behind, from behind the sheep, and he called you and separated you for his service. You feel so, so, so ungrateful that God would do that to you, and you just say, man, and I, I, how can I start you over here like giving up and, and, and ready to throw up, throw in the towel when God went through so much more? Man, I'm ready to, I'm on fire and I'm ready to do more for God. I haven't done enough. That was Paul. That was Paul. That's why he says, I, no, I worked harder than all of them. Because the grace of God was with me. The grace of God makes me want to get here on time. The grace of God makes me to get up tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock and be here for 6 a.m. prayer. The grace of God gives me the energy even when my legs are tired. When I, when I just want to rest and just call it a night. The grace of God comes and, 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 and awakens me. And reminds me that my work here isn't done. And there's a lot to do for God. There's a lot to do for God. We're not wasting our time here. Get an injection of the grace of God. I pray that today the Lord would give us an impartation of his grace. You know, when I was younger, I used to open up the Bible and, you know, God would give me a message. And I found preaching easy to me. Now it's so hard to preach. And I used to say to myself, man, when I become, you know, 30, 40, 50, preaching will be easy to me. If it's easy to me now that I'm 20, I open up, I prepare some notes, I just preach, I just say whatever. And, and I thought I was, man, by the time I get to 40, I, I, I'll master this. This will be easy. But it gets, but, but because God is doing something in our lives, right? And, and you just see, you respect the word and you respect the calling. And you see yourself with every passing year, how incapable you are. Then you start relying more on the grace of God. And, and, and you just realize this is harder than I used to. I thought that by now I would have perfected this. And I feel like I've gotten worse at it. But it's God showing me that it is not me, but his grace in me. Not to depend on myself, but depend on his grace on me. So it, it's like there's another level of, of weight and responsibility that I didn't understand when I was 23 years old preaching in, you know, two different churches in one day. Probably regretting now that what I said back then. <laughs> So, but the grace of God propels me to continue to serve the Lord. The grace of God 
motivates me. It pushes me to continue to work in the kingdom of God. Sometimes we don't see results. Sometimes as a pastor, you don't see results. Vivid results. You want to see more vivid results. And it becomes very discouraging. I remember back in 2006 or 7, maybe, maybe 5, 2005, I went to a youth retreat with the, the pastor of the youth of that time. And I remember that he invited our pastor, Radames, to be there and to be the speaker uh, of that weekend. And I remember that, you know, I was excited to be there. My wife, the, the boys, you know, they, we were there. I don't even think Joseph was born yet. And we went somewhere in Pennsylvania, and I'm just excited to be with the youth. It was a pretty big group, maybe about 100 young people there. And I was excited because my pastor was there, you know, and I would get an opportunity to talk to him. And I remember that uh, one morning for breakfast, uh, you know, we're there, and he calls me over. He just motions to me, and I feel so privileged. Wow, he's going to talk to me. The pastor's going to talk to me, you know. So I go, and I sit with him, and I'm like like a sponge ready to receive anything he's got to say. He just puts his head down and he goes, oh, Taco, I'm so discouraged. It's just so discouraged right now. I'm like, oh, is the, wow, what, Pastor, you okay? You all right? You got to preach in about 30 minutes? He's like, oh, you just don't understand, Taco. God has shown me what the church should be, but we're not there yet. And I go to the countries. I've, I've gone to Spain. I've gone to Argentina. I've gone to different places. And it's just the lack, the lack. It's just so discouraged. And I, I was just like taken aback because, you know, he was opening up an aspect of his ministry, his his discouragements in the ministry that I had not seen from him before. I always saw him here, you know, just preaching and, 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 and just modeling, you know, to me, a, a man of God, a man on fire for God, a man anointed, right, with, with a revelation of his word. And, and to see him in that light, to me, it was, a, it was a different panorama. And I was just taken aback by that. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I really came that he was going to just, I don't know, tell me something. And, and it wasn't that. And, and this is a reality. Many ministers, it doesn't even have to be a pastor. People that minister in the congregation in whatever facet, we go through circumstances. We go through things. We're human beings. We're, we're emotional human beings. Sometimes we're going to be afflicted when, when there's a miscommunication with someone else, right? There's sometimes misunderstandings and clashes and things that happen, right? And many times we just want to close everything and just, I, I just give up. I'm done. I, I. But then the grace of God comes upon us. And we just say, you know what? It's not time. I, I'm, I'm caught up in my emotion. It's not time yet. I don't do this for man. I do this for the Lord. The Lord was the one who called me and set me apart. And I remember when the pastor said that to me, I was like, wow. I left there, not sad, but understanding his burden. And it gave me, a, it gave me an opportunity to see him in a different place and now pray for him, right? And pray for him at another level. Oh, Lord, instead of just, Lord, yeah, bless him, fill him with your spirit, power, and revelation. Now I could, Lord, help him in his moments when he's down, when he's discouraged. He's a man at the end of the day. He's not an angel that fell from heaven last night. He's a man who walks here on earth. And God allowed me to see that. Because as ministers and anybody who works in any facet in the congregation, it, it, there are moments when we want to just, just, just give it up. But the grace of God compels us to keep on serving the Lord. Keep on serving. Take your eyes off man. Put your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is never discouraged. Jesus doesn't look at the circumstances. 
Jesus is always hopeful. Jesus is always alive. He's always on, he, he, he's always just ready for the, what's next? What's next? What's next? Jesus is always energized. Jesus is never discouraged. And the grace of God, I don't know what it does. It just, yeah, let's go. What's next? What's next? That's what the grace of God does. I want to finish by saying a few things. Grace teaches us to leave the sinful life by saying no to ungodliness and to worldly passions. Grace teaches us the sanctified life. To live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life. And grace teaches us the service life. So it teaches you to say no to the sinful life. But then it teaches you to say yes to the sanctified life. And to the service life. Now I want us to go back to Exodus 34. There is a warning as I end this message. I wouldn't be a faithful messenger if I didn't finish with this warning. I want you to know that I struggled with this aspect of the message. I wanted to end with what I just said. But the Lord kept harping. You have to read the other part of Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Remember when we read Exodus 34, 6 and I stopped halfway on 7? I wouldn't be a faithful messenger if I didn't read the rest of verse 7. And I'm not trying to throw any cold water on this message but every every coin has two sides and God has two sides he is a gracious God he is slow to anger he is loving forgiving forgives up to a thousand generations but look what verse 7 says We'll read six. Let's read six so we get the whole context again. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Maintaining love to a, to thousands and forgiving wickedness rebellion and sin that's the God you and I serve yet I can't be a faithful messenger if we don't finish this verse yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished he punishes the children and the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation the grace of God is one aspect of God. But God is also a God of judgment because he's a God of equity. In this world, people want equality. God is not a God of equality. Let me say that again. God is not a God of equality. God is a God of equity. Equality says is outcome based. Equity is truth based. God is not so much concerned about the outcome. He's concerned that the truth reign because he's the God of truth. He's the God of equity, not the God of equality. And the God of equity says 
I am the good, gracious, loving, merciful, abounding in love, forgiving to a thousand generations. But I'm also the God that punishes the guilty. And I ask myself, Lord, who are the guilty ones? Who are the guilty ones that, he's, that he punishes? Because at the end of the day, we're all guilty. I want you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. There are three groups here that are guilty. Hebrews 10, 26. Hebrews 10, 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. 28, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who number one, let's go through the three groups, tramples the son of God underfoot. When you trample Jesus, when you when, when you hold in low esteem who Jesus is and what he does, you run into the category of the guilty. Number two, who has treated as, unho as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them. Group number two, who are the guilty? The ones that, that, that treat the blood of Christ as an unholy thing. They make jokes about the blood of Christ. They make, they, they make low of it. They mistreat it. They, they, they disrespect it. They trample on Jesus. They trample on the blood of Jesus. They disrespect it. They treat it as unholy. But the third group is and who has insulted the spirit of grace. In other words, you've taken the grace of God and you've perverted it. You've played with the grace of God. You've taken God's grace, God in heaven, who is merciful, who loves you and has constantly shown you his favor. He's constantly humiliating himself to uphold you and you take his grace and you spit on it by sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning and taking it lightly I am here to tell you that the, the, the fire of God the judgment of God is coming and you better change because God is not to be mocked I didn't even want to say what I'm saying I struggled with God because I did not want to say this but the presence of God the fire of God was in my belly in my bones and he told me Dago you're not my faithful messenger if you don't speak my truth
Members of the altar, please come on up. Hallelujah. No one's going to lose their salvation. Salvation is a gift of God. And it's free. And if he has chosen you and you are in this house, you're saved by the grace of God. But just because you're saved by the grace of God, we could still come under God's judgment. Let's avoid God's judgment by not insulting the spirit of grace. It's not so much about salvation. You got salvation already. God bought you salvation. Your name is written in the book of life. And, now, and no matter how many times you sin, there is an advocate for you in heaven. There is a mediator. His name is Jesus, who's constantly bringing you to the presence of God. We're not talking about anybody losing their salvation. But we're talking about incurring the judgment of God. When we insult the spirit of grace, may the grace of God be imparted upon you here tonight. May the grace of God today come upon you like never before. May he open your eyes to see God's grace. God's favor upon you. God's kindness. God will never stop doing you good. But because he's a God of equity, he punishes those that take his grace lightly. He loves you. He's giving you all the abilities to succeed. You're in the school of grace. And grace is here to enable you to live for him. His grace is sufficient. I want us to sing the song Amazing Grace as we wrap up here tonight.